So as a proud graduate of Southeast Missouri State, I have been without the campus for about a year now, a little over a year. And during that time, I have definitely done a lot of reminiscing. I've thought back to all the times as a kid that I used to wish away wanting to be adult. And I've also thought about some of the most frustrating times I had as a child. For instance, I always hated and it was always so frustrating not understanding why your parents made the decisions that they made. You see, as kids, we had these alternative realities and these parallel universes that we got to live and play in, all while also trying to figure out the world that we actually went to sleep and woke up inside of each day. Our parents, though, unfortunate to them, were living in reality, so to speak. If you remember the movie The Matrix, Morpheus might have said that our parents had taken the red pill and become a little more enlightened. You see, what was so different from my, in my world was I was concerned with things like food, of course, toys and like dinosaurs, and the latter literally didn't even exist to my parents anymore. But they were living in a time where the most important thing was to prepare my sister and I for things that we truly didn't understand that were already affecting our lives. The most obvious of those was being an African American. You see, my parents were the lecturers. They were the type of parents that would always give this 10 to 15 minute spiel if you were lucky, sometimes 20 or 30, conveying the lesson that they wanted to give at that time. They would also give these routine talks whenever we would go places. So if we were going to go to the store for a couple you know, particular items, they'd always give the, don't ask for anything, don't touch anything, we're going to go in the store and we'll be right out. And so, of course, as a kid, I'm going to challenge that, and I'm going to ask for some things, and I'm going to touch some things. But my parents like to call it looking with my hands. And I got in trouble just as many times as I decided I wanted to challenge them. But then, you know, I started to catch on, stopped challenging them so much, and then I started getting in trouble again. But it wasn't for looking with my hands or for asking for something. It was for doing what I'm doing right now and having my hands in my pocket. You see, my mom used to always say, keep your hands out of your pocket. There's no reason to walk around the store like that. So to summarize at this point, whenever I go to a store, I can't ask for anything. I can't touch anything. And now I can't even have my hands in my own pockets. Again, very frustrating and something that was really hard to understand. Well, then there was a time where I went to the store with my grandmother and things kind of changed. You see, my sister played in the orchestra and whenever she was at practice, my grandmother would take my cousin and I to the store so that we could walk around and kill some time. Well, there was this one time in particular where we were walking around the store and after about 15 minutes or so, my grandmother turned around and began to scold the woman that had been following us in the store. She even recounted the different aisles we had been on in her position to us in those aisles. And later that night, I realized and was taught how as African Americans, statistics say that we are more likely to steal things. So that confirms their suspicion enough to follow us around the store. And even having my hands in my pocket may validate their wrong suspicions. And so this was one of the first times in my life where I realized that the world that I lived in and who I was in that world may be a little different than reality, so to speak. So, you know, my parents still nevertheless always told me to follow my dreams and do what I wanted. So the first day of high school, I decided to join the swim team. Now again, like I said, I started to understand some things. And so I realized why they say black people don't swim, because you don't really see us around the pool for that often. But we never really talk much about why African Americans don't swim. You see, in the 1920s is when swimming in America became something of recreation. Well, if we remember what the 1920s were like for a lot of minorities, it wasn't the best place. And recreation wasn't necessarily the thing that most of our time was spent doing. You see, not just the 20s, but even in 1964, let's go back a little bit. Even in 1964, we were still having these issues. This picture above me depicts James Brock, the motel owner of the Motel Motorsports Lodge. And in 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King was arrested. And as a peaceful protest, you can see in the picture blacks and whites swimming in the pool. Well, the motel owner decided that he didn't want his motel to be seen as a place where this was accepted, so he began to pour acid in the very pool. And so, you know, I can definitely understand with images and times like this why you don't see African Americans around these spaces so long. Well, as for my swim team in high school, we were half black and half white. And everywhere we went, it seemed like people would remind us of that. But it wasn't like they were saying something. It was these all too familiar glances of disapproval as if we were unbelonging. 
But it was always nice to take particular note of those same faces whenever we would leave the pools as well, noting the difference between what they thought was going to happen by the looks of our team and the results that the scoreboards would actually display. I also took a lot of AP classes in high school. I was the kid, and you can ask some of my teachers here, that would always talk or find some other ways to entertain myself. And AP classes, for the first time, really garnered my attention so that I could spend my time doing what the teacher would like me to do. Well, again, this decision landed me in a place where I was the minority. But what was weird was I wasn't getting those looks and resistance from the kids in those classrooms. Actually, most of those kids became some of the closest people in my life. But it was my fellow black students in the hallways and the ones who would talk about me at lunch for saying I was too much like white for being in those classrooms, let alone being a swimmer. And, you know, it even made me start to question things because it was the experiences I had at those pools and it was the skills that I learned in those classrooms that really helped me start to understand why the world considers my blackness such a critical condition. And so, High school really helped kind of curve my naive nature in a lot of way from that childish one I used to have, but it wasn't until I got to this campus that I was truly challenged in some ways. Like I said, I was a, I was swam, so I was a lifeguard. That was the best job I thought I could have, and I got to move into college early. That way I could go to training. Well, after my first day of lifeguard training, one of the head guards asked if I wanted to come hang out with him, but little did I know he was planning to invite me to hang out with his fraternity brothers. Well, two weeks later, I proudly become a member of Sigma Nu International Fraternity Incorporated, which is not one of the historically black colleges of on this camp, or I'm sorry, not one of the historically black fraternities on this campus. I also declared my major as political science and became one of seven African Americans to join the department. Having the opportunity to study from Obama's second term of presidency my freshman year till the rise and victory of Donald Trump my senior year brought about many challenging conversations. Something that it also did was it helped me study the plight in American politics, but also living on this very campus. You see, there were experiences I had when I would walk through the university center and people would question the legitimacy of the letters that were on your chest. You know, there were times when I would go to a black event and people would look at me as if I didn't belong there or I was the one wearing the pointed hat. But I even had someone come up to me before, look me in my eyes and say that I was a complete sellout for joining a predominantly white organization and that that was me truly disconnecting myself from the black and African American struggling cause. But like Morpheus might have said about my parents years ago, compared to my adolescent self, I didn't really have this shallow perspective on my life. It was in Vince and in times like this where someone was pouring acid on my dreams that I was always reminded by, Link by a poem from Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was the first African American to make a living from writing and he was also born right here in the state of Missouri in a little city known as Joplin. He wrote in one of his poems, I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh, eat well, and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes, and nobody will dare say to me eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. You see, I was always reminded by this poem because here Hughes was so boldly declaring that he too was American, that his spirit, his culture, and who he decided he wanted to be would be accepted in society. And so I was always confused why so many people on both sides of society were telling me who I was or who I was supposed to be and why I couldn't just boldly live my American spirit as well. You know, I would be remiss to not mention what a tragedy it would have been in my life if I didn't have someone like Langston Hughes to refer to. Someone who didn't live confined by the society that they were a part of, but boldly living their own truth, being able to write it and be compensated for it. It was also Langston Hughes that lived as a fighting example the synonymous relationship that an American ha life has with a quote-unquote white one. You see, doing the white thing in practice truly is what the American thing should be. And so it was in these moments that Langston Hughes gave me a lot of comfort in my life. So that's why I conclude today saying that it is so important that you know yourself and that you live your own life and that you don't listen to what society tells you you are, but undeniably live your own truth 
because that truth and that confidence that it gives you is much too large for the box society wants to put it in. You see, the American dream is struggling and the American struggle is dreaming. It's just that the deferences for my wishes have failed to be acknowledged by society. But something I have witnessed is the appropriation of my culture because we are such the hot commodity. Somehow my skin alone is not, or at least that's what society's actions proclaim. But I've always lived my actions speaking louder than words, so I've made sure that the efforts before mine go not in vain. You know, see, I used to question what it was that I lacked. Obviously too black for white, yet somehow I was still too white to be black. It's like my actions brought about this crisis of identification, as if we had moved from a social to a more mental form of segregation. From our homelands, we were taken to a land with no consideration, where kings and queens were transitioned to lives as slaves with limitations. But metaphorically and literally, those slaves followed the Nile River's path and flowed from south to north just to escape slavery's wrath. So in 2018, I no longer wake with the taste of an apology in my mouth. And though this is not the 1960s, in many ways we still have an indecent north and a racial south. But I am to be seen by my outward projections. I no longer internalize others' thoughts of suppressions. And how sad it is that some of my own brothers and sisters have been influenced by these misconceptions. My parents have always taught me to be more like the prideful lost traveler because I seek no other's direction. To say my activities make me any less or more so black would be admitting ignorance and giving all of my personal authority back. So as long as you know yourself, your vision they cannot distort. These are my conclusions of the Minority Report. Thank you.